Hey guys, welcome back. Today, I want to talk about female androgenetic alopecia, aka female pattern hair loss. Hi, my name is Dr. Jenny Liu. I'm a board certified dermatologist and welcome back to my YouTube channel. So hair loss is a very common complaint. And recently, I've been getting a lot of questions about female pattern hair loss and ways to address that. So I thought it would be very helpful for me to be on here and make a video explaining what is female pattern hair loss, the causes, and what are some of the treatments that are available, whether over the counter or prescription that can help with that condition. Androgenetic alopecia or pattern hair loss experienced by 40 to 50% of women throughout their lifetime. There's a higher incidence in Caucasian women, but it is something that can be universally experienced by majority of women. There is a multitude of causes. We know that it is a condition that can be genetically predisposed. And the genetics is not straightforward, is what we call polygenetics. So there isn't like one gene that is responsible for this female pattern hair loss, but certainly a propensity of this condition running in the family, whether in mom, dad, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, is often seen. And what female pattern hair loss is, is a distinct type of hair thinning that we see predominantly on the crown of the head and usually will progressively worsen over time if there is no treatment done. It does not lead to complete loss or balding of the entire scalp, but usually with time, the hair that is predominantly seen on the crown will get thinner over time. Now we do know that in men, androgen hormones seems to be a main driver of male pattern hair loss, which is what we typically see in men, kind of usually with the recession of the frontal and the bitemporal hairlines, as well as thinning on the crown. But in women, Androgen seems to play a role, but the exact role, and if there are other things involved, is not 100% clear. But certainly we see that a lot of the treatments that work for male pattern hair loss seems to be helpful for women. So we do know that androgen hormones do seem to play an important role in driving female pattern hair loss. So what is happening here with the hormones, specifically the androgen hormones, in women and men, we all make testosterone. It's just in women, there is a lower degree. And what is happening is that the testosterone is being converted to dihydrotestosterone, which is the more potent form of androgen hormone that acts on our hair and skin. It is also this hormone that seems to play a role in acne and sebum production and excessive hair growth, hirsutism, as well as pattern hair loss that we see both in men and women. And what is happening in androgenic alopecia is this hormone essentially is driving what we call miniaturization of antigen hair follicles. So in our scalp, in one point in time, we all have a finite amount of hair that is growing, finite that's resting, and then about, you know, a certain percentage, a smaller percentage that is resting and then about to be shed. And what is happening with androgenetic alopecia is that the hormone is causing the miniaturization of the growing hair follicles. So over time, the hair is thinner and more fine. So instead of terminal longer hair, there were more of the fine vellus hairs that would develop and then basically over time leads to thinning and more balding of the areas that are affected by androgenetic alopecia. Another thing that we see is that hair follicles usually grow in tufts of like three to four and in female or male pattern hair loss, the hormones is basically shifting and you're losing more of that hair follicle in each tuft. So again, speaking to the process of hair thinning and eventually shorter, fine hair that kind of gives the perception of thinner hair and then kind of balding, potentially balding in certain areas, but it does not lead to complete loss of hair throughout the entire scalp because not all the hair follicles in your entire scalp is sensitive to this type of hormonal change, which is also why we tend to see the pattern of androgenetic alopecia the way, the way we do. As I mentioned earlier, this condition, if untreated, is progressive. Again, it does not lead to to complete baldness, meaning you are not going to lose your entire head of hair, but over time, if it's untreated, does lead to more thinner and thinner hair, less density, and then maybe potentially balding of parts of your hair, but not complete loss of the entire head of hair on your scalp. Now, for the most part, most women with female pattern hair loss are healthy. They usually don't have any underlying hormonal abnormality or hyperandrogenism. Certainly, female 
female pattern hair loss can be associated with conditions like polycystic ovarian syndrome, states where there is excessive androgen hormones that may be associated with hirsutism, acne, and you know, excessive sebum production. But most of the time there isn't like a true hormonal imbalance where there needs to be a medication that you need to take that will impact other parts of your body. It's mostly just the androgen effects on your skin and on your hair follicles. So what are the treatments available for treating female pattern hair loss? Unfortunately, there are not a lot that are FDA approved. The only treatment that is FDA approved for treating female pattern hair loss is topical minoxidil. I recommend here doing the 5% foam. We know that minoxidil, as I mentioned before, we think how it helps is increases blood flow, causes vasodilation, increases nutrients to the scalp. And certainly it doesn't work well in everyone, but has been shown that it can stop the progression in up to 60% of individuals who use it on a regular basis and can improve some of the hair density in a certain percentage of individuals as well. It is one of those things where it is pretty safe to use. You do have to give it at least three to six months. And there is this really scary potential increase in shedding in the beginning that has to do with the medicine synchronizing your hair follicles. And so shifting all of your hair from growing to resting and shedding, then that will kind of cycle through and then you get more hair growth afterwards. So as long as you can kind of get over that potential increase in shedding in the beginning and just understand that you have to use it for at least three to six months before seeing a result. The other thing too is because androgenetic hair loss is progressive, you have to continue using it if you are seeing improvements. Because of the condition, it is something, if it is working for you, something you do kind of have to use going forward to maintain the growth that you do see on the minoxidil. Minoxidil comes in different strength. As I mentioned earlier, 5% is what's been shown to help with men and women. Usually the foam formulation is a lot more tolerable, less irritating than the solution. And so that is something that I recommend trying for most women. It can be safe even during lactation. Again, something I would recommend you speaking with your provider about. The next option available that is a little more readily accessible than some of the prescription medications is low level laser light therapy. So this is using red light that has been shown to be helpful in maybe stimulating a hair follicle and stimulating hair growth. And we don't know exactly how it works. And we think it may have a similar mechanism to minoxidil. But basically what it's shown is basically helpful with stimulating the nutrition, the metabolism of what's happening in your hair follicle and improving hair growth. To be honest, is something that again, very similar to minoxidil, something you do have to use on a regular basis for a good period of time is something you may have to continue doing. And I find that these laser hair combs or helmets, whatever you are going to be using is really best when you combine it with other treatment modalities. So really not going to be amazing by using it alone. But if you are using minoxidil foam, this can be something that you can add that may give you additional benefits in the clinical improvements. The next thing are procedures that can be done in office. And these are PRP, platelet rich plasma injections, as well as microneedling. And sometimes these two are combined together to give an enhanced efficacy. Again, these are similar to the light treatment. I think great complements to topical or prescription medications certainly can be used alone, but I think the benefit are really when you combine it with other treatment modalities. And this is kind of a theme that you're going to see th throughout this video is for the most part for hair loss, when it comes to treating hair loss, there's not one single treatment that's going to be helpful for everyone. Everybody's going to be a little different. Some people may respond to oral medicines better. Some people may respond to topical monoxyl better. And certainly when you combine multiple modalities, so treatment topically, orally, as well as later, you're going to get additional benefits than just using one treatment alone. Now let's talk about some of the prescription medications that your dermatologist may discuss with you. The first one is called Propecia or the generic name is called Finasteride. Now this medicine at one milligram daily is approved for male pattern hair loss. It is probably by far of all the oral medications available out there, probably one of the better studied ones for female pattern hair loss as well. It's just that female pattern hair loss in general compared to male pattern hair loss have not been as studied as extensively when it comes to treatment. But certainly this medication has been shown to be helpful. I think there's just uncertainties with regards to the exact dose of the medication. Some suggest that one milligram, like what's used for men have been helpful. Some reports say for women, it may be a higher dose that's necessary. And then the other things are the side effects you should be aware of. So for number one, finasteride is probably 
pregnancy category X. It is known to cause birth defects very similar to Accutane. And so usually because of that, it's rarely prescribed for women of child reproductive age. When you even look at the efficacy of this medication, it seems like postmenopausal women tend to respond a little bit better than premenopausal women. Not that we can give this medicine to younger women who are able to have kids, but there is certainly that risk that you need to talk to your provider about. The other risks that we know of with finasteride are the sexual side effects. So the decrease in libido and sexual drive. And that as far as like how much and how frequent we don't know the true effects in women, but certainly has been reported as well as mood changes along with few other things. So certainly a medication that can work well can be helpful, but need to be discussed with your provider to make sure that it can be an appropriate medication for you. Now a newer medication on the market that's not quite approved yet is called dutasteride, which is a similar medication to finasteride. And by the way, both of these work by inhibiting the 5-alpha reductase enzyme, which is the enzyme that converts testosterone to DHT. And we know that when you have no working enzymes present, and some people actually have a genetic defect when they don't have this enzyme, you don't get really acne or hair loss. So it's quite amazing how basically the mechanism works. Dutasteride seems to have more promising benefits, maybe lower or similar side effects, but seems to work a little bit better. And certainly both of these medications have been studied in men and women. It's just right now there is not that many available and there are still more coming. And so that is potentially another medicine that your doctor may talk to you about that works very similarly to finasteride. The next medication is oral minoxidil. So like topical minoxidil, oral minoxidil basically helps to vasodilate, bring nutrients to your scalp. And again, we don't know how it fully works, but certainly we do see that it tends to work a little bit better than the topical. But the caveat is that it does, like most oral medications, have more side effects and the ones could include blood pressure changes. And the other that can be undesired is hypertrichosis. So undesired excessive hair growth on the face or body. Lastly, one medication that we prescribe as dermatologists frequently for acne and hirsutism may be helpful in treating female pattern hair loss. And the medication is called spironolactone. And I have talked about this medication many times on my social media, as well as a few videos here where I answer some questions about spironolactone. So definitely check those videos out if you want to learn more about the medication. But here, how spironolactone is working is basically it's an androgen receptor blocker. So really prevents the hormones from binding to the receptors on your hair follicles or on your skin and carry out the mechanism of action. So that's really how it works for acne. Now, as far as its effects for hair loss, again, not that many out there. Certainly some of the case reports and studies have shown promising results. And really the results are enhanced when spironolactone is combined with other treatments like minoxidil, whether it's oral or topical, or even oral other oral prescription medications. The thing you need to know about spironolactone is often for the treatment of hair loss, female pattern hair loss, the doses are usually higher than what it's typically used to treat acne for one. And two, you need to be on it for at least six months before you have a visible noticeable improvement. Certainly for someone who have PCOS related skin and hair concerns like hirsutism, acne, and hair loss, this would be a very good medication to start with and to try. And certainly I personally feel more comfortable prescribing this medicine because it has lower side effects, if you will, of all the other medications. Just as far as like the true efficacy, I think it still needs to be teased out, but certainly can be helpful if you are experiencing hair loss as well as other concerns like acne and hirsutism. Now, when it comes to hair supplements, if you are going to take any, the two that I recommend that are actually backed by science and evidence is Viviscal and Nutrafil. Keep in mind that these are costly, but can be helpful as an overall treatment algorithm for your hair loss. Besides those two, I certainly don't recommend other supplements personally, and you have to be mindful of what you take because excessive supplement intake can mess with your other medications. It can certainly cause other issues with your overall health. For example, biotin, we know can cause elevation in thyroid hormones, cause abnormal pregnancy or false pregnancy tests, and can interact with certain cardiac tests. So you always want to be mindful when taking supplements. All right, that was a lot of information. I hope you found this video helpful. Let me know in the comments below if you have any questions about hair loss in general, if there are other hair loss topics you want me to address. And if you are on any of these treatments, let me know if they have worked for you and which products you are currently using for treating your hair loss. Again, I would love it if you can give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I will see you guys next time. Bye.